Welcome to Film Trace. This is the podcast where we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception. We have a special guest today and a special movie. Uh, Chris, do you want to welcome our guest and tell us, tell the audience what we're going to talk about today? Yeah. First, uh, thanks so much, uh, Evan from Spoiler Piece Theater and the Boston Film Critics Association for joining us. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to talk about the movie, which you will talk about in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh you know we're, we're trading off this season of film trace dan's choosing the new movies i'm digging into what older films are uh, premiering on the streaming services and i just uh i was looking and as we kind of do you know it we look for something we find it but then we try to find something better and just nothing else materializes we go back to that first option and it, and it just stuck out like a sore thumb to me on that first list i was looking at what was new on prime video for the month of October 2020, and yeah, Species, uh, starring Natasha Henstridge, directed by Roger Donaldson, and featuring the production design work of none other than H.R. Geiger. Uh, it's an alien movie featuring the designer of Alien, but way worse. So <laughs> I was just so curious to rewatch it as a grown man after seeing it. I think I was 11, actually, when I saw it, Dan. Yeah. And okay, I, yeah, you okay, you said that makes you, sense. You were 13, you're a little older than me. I think, it, um, I think it bears sort of mentioning that this film for people of that age yes. probably has like a weird sort of memory thing going on uh, because <laughs> we were like young teenage men uh, and it was just one of those films that was like sci-fi but like really kind of like, um, I don't know, erotic sci-fi? Softcore, I, I think might is. be the word you're looking for. <laughs> exactly, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, there you go, okay, perfect. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it just, it's one of those things where I think we were talking with one of our friends and the the line that keeps, or sort of word that keeps coming up to my head is like seared in my memory. And I think like a lot <laughs> of this, certain parts of this film are definitely seared in my memory. So it's a really weird rewatch, I would say, right? Absolutely. And uh, I, I, I have to admit it lived up to my expectations re-watching it um it's even worse than i remember but also just as watchable as i remember and i'm curious <laughs> if you guys had similar uh reactions to it it's absolutely terrible but i was not looking at the clock or trying to see what the running time was at at any point i i, I sat there and i watched it and it went by in the blink of an eye yeah i, I- Evan, this might have been your first watch, right? Yeah, so I know for sure I had seen Species 2 before, but I'm not entirely certain that I had seen Species. And so I have to say it is a weird movie, but it is (laughs) weirdly watchable. Like you were just saying, it holds your attention, even though it's just utter nonsense the whole way through. (laughs) How does it compare to Species 2? You know, it's been a while since I've seen that as well, <laughs> but I think probably yeah. better because I can't imagine that this that Species Two was better than Species. <laughs> no, that's, that's probably yeah. How do, how do you improve on this? Really, it's uh, yeah. I I I don't remember Species Two at all. But like you said, Dan, I think the original Species, though I don't know if I've I've seen one more than the other. Uh, but uh, this is the one that definitely is seared in my memory. One thing that was not seared in my memory, the fact that Michelle Williams is in the opening handful right. of scenes Had no as clue. the young version no clue. of Did our not that at all. antagonist. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's back up a second. Dan, tell us, what is the general plot of Species? The the plot's actually really fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so it actually... You mean the fugitive? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's sort of... <laughs> it's a lot more intelligent than I remember it being. Uh, so essentially, uh, government... Uh, people who work in SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, they send out a message into space, they get a response, uh, and it's basically a DNA sequence. And they decide, hey, let's try and, um, you know, use this and create a hybrid. And they do. Uh, and that's Michelle Williams, goes by Sill in this movie. Um, and essentially, um, they start growing her in a lab. Ben, ben Kingsley is the doctor. Uh, Xavier Finch. What a ridiculous name. Um, <laughs> the names are great. Yeah, yeah. the names and, in this movie uh, are ridiculous. Exactly, yeah. I, it's almost, you ha- kind of have to wonder if it's like, I guess it's intentional on some level, like the ton in cheek genre-ness of this film, but I don't really know. Uh, so he tries to, um, you know, uh, grow this hybrid. He does. Uh, the, he has to kill her. Uh, he tries to kill her. She escapes. 
uh, and she wants to mate. And essentially, it's a group, uh, this uh, A team or I guess Z team, whatever you want to call them, uh, <laughs> of people come together of scientists, the CIA guy, I guess he is an empath. Uh, and they try and sort of stop this alien hybrid from uh, mating with a male. And that's the entire plot, essentially. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. that's pretty much it. Uh, it is strange how uh, Rod- Roger Donaldson, the director, was approached uh, for this movie because he was a guy that was definitely not known for this kind of nonsense. But it actually began with uh, Frank Mancuso Jr., who had launched his career um, off the back of his father, who did a bunch of really big and often critically acclaimed westerns like The Wild Bunch. Um, but uh, Frank Jr. did not want to go that route. He produced Friday the 13th Part 2 and Part 3 and so on and so forth, April Fool's Day, uh, and somehow wanted to uh, kind of try to his hand at the the sci-fi uh, horror subgenre. And he, of all people went that he could have gone to, went to Roger Donaldson who was basically only known for uh, Kevin Costner vehicle No Way Out, like a revenge thriller, mm-hmm. and the uh, kind of party Tom Cruise film uh, drama Cocktail. Why Why in the world? Do you have any... I, I actually have never seen No Way Out, and I barely remember Cocktail. So do, is there any insight from either of you guys why oh, they would have man. gone to Donaldson? I mm. don't. I don't really know, to be honest with you. I mean, the, I found an interesting quote about him. Um, I forget what... Um, interview or review is in but they gave him like really high praise for essentially um like sparking the film a film movement in new zealand uh Hmm. and like he was famous for that and um he's like a really important person in new zealand film world uh but outside of that there's not really a lot that points to redoing alien i don't know evan do you know any more about this guy i don't really know that much about him well, I've seen No Way Out, and it it's a pretty solid thriller. It has yeah. a, I think, a pretty well known twist ending, which I'm not going to reveal here. But it has, I think, a pretty good twist. So I could see someone watching that and thinking, okay, maybe this guy could do, you know, uh, something interesting. I have not seen Cocktail in a very long time, but I've heard it really doesn't hold up. <laughs> so I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, did did, did No Way Out uh, kind of lean into like the B movie thriller aspect, or is it kind of more like solid, like uh, elevated at all? What kind of yeah, vibe does it go for? It's it's kind of it's a kind of a spy movie, and it has um, okay. It involves like a government conspiracy and trying to find a mole that's you know inside a government agency, and so yeah, it's got some twists and turns, and it's not overly action packed, but it's definitely a lot of you know, sneaking around and trying not to get caught kind of situations. And that I think makes for an exciting movie. Gotcha. Cool. Well, I will have to check that out. Um, Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, At the very least, you know, you always hope that getting somebody that's not super uh, experienced in one genre, the the downside obviously is lack of experience, but the upside is put a fresh spin on it. But it, I think one of the things that kind of falls apart here. Uh, that is also maybe a reason why maybe uh, Dante's Peak is the, uh, you know, for me anyways, it's a soft spot for the 90s, but it never really, <laughs> I feel, got uh, any kind of, uh, you know, notoriety in the midst of all the natural disaster movies of that yeah. time period. And it's kind of like Donald Donaldson doesn't really have that much of a style to him. Like if he doesn't have a solid script, then it's just going to be like there's a quote um, that uh, a reason why he didn't really vibe with this movie because it's so effects heavy is because he wants to have a lot of freedom with the camera. So he doesn't have like a certain you know aesthetic that he's going for, but he wants to be very open. And the effects of this movie made it so that he was unable to do that. And so you get a lot of these kind of stilted scenes, especially a lot of uh, kind of randomness with the actors, his ensemble of uh, weird scenes where Michael Madsen is taking a butterscotch candy out of a dish. And that's, like a, <laughs> that's like my little favorite shot in the entire movie. It's I love so that It's so bizarre. Shot. It makes so no bizarre. sense. No sense. Uh, the vibe's all over the place. I think the writer here, too, is interesting. Dennis yeah. Feldman essentially tacked on. So Donaldson wrote this thing, uh, ended up sort of, they hired Feldman to come in and do rewrites on it. But essentially, they threw all that out. And it went through like mm-hmm. eight different drafts. So it definitely it's his writing at the end of the day. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, is there is there any real style to this film outside of what uh, HR uh, Geiger brought to it with his production production design overall? What do you guys think? Is there is there something here? Is there a, a, an accent here that we're missing to the the cinematography, the editing, anything like that? I th- I think so. I think the cinematography yeah. here is noteworthy. I I I think that that might have something to do with why it's watchable. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. just looking at uh, on Andre's uh Barth- Barthawiak. <laughs> I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly at That's all. As good as I but, can do it, yeah. But yeah, just looking at you know some of his filmography as a cinematographer, Falling Down, um, Prince of the City, some movies that I've seen that I thought were good, so I could see that. Oh, and then I see he also worked on Devil's Advocate, which is yes, just I was gonna so say much that. fun. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> which is a very fun yeah. movie. Not a very good movie, but a very fun movie with some mm-hmm. cool looks to it, without a doubt. So, yeah, I yeah, think, I think that, we have that here. Yeah, yeah he, was, he, w- he definitely was, I think, the saving grace of what made this movie kind of come together. And I would also add uh, Christopher Young doing the music. Uh, he's kind of been somebody that's been under the radar, but has kind of put together some really good scores, but also some really cheesy scores. But either way, he he knows how to do an effective cue. And uh, it's not necessarily that interesting in this movie, but I think it definitely adds to the the propulsion of the, you know, uh, woman on the run theme. And same thing with uh, Bartholiak's, uh shots. He... Everything from like uh, Natasha Henstridge in that wedding dress going down the streets of Los yeah. Angeles to the nightmare train uh, dreams and nightmares. Um, it really feels like there's energy going on here. And it's, I think, because of the people behind the camera that aren't Donaldson, ultimately. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, what do we make of this? What do you guys think of the concept number one? Uh, and do we think that that it was fully flushed out uh, and did it manifest as a good story on screen? I mean, I'm going to jump to the gun and say the concept is interesting at the very least, uh, but the script itself is a complete another mess. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's one of the main reasons why the film does just not really work uh, past the half hour mark, I would say. I don't know. What do you mm-hmm. guys think about that in terms of the conception of the film? I think that uh, it's interesting that Donaldson ended up writing this all himself because he actually said no to the concept at the beginning because it was a horror movie. Uh, And then basically um, MGM told him about the, you know, story uh, behind uh, SETI and he's like, oh, yeah, I've read Carl Sagan. And then he gets sucked into it. And so, like. That would make sense with your analysis, Dan, that that first half hour is strong because he's totally bought into this concept of dna codes being sent back and uh it's it's a good way to get it started but uh i don't know i mean as soon as i re- realized that we were dealing with this you know a seti related inciting incident it just made me uh long for like an actual movie about that like contact um but it really needed to get into like the weirdo like Forrest Whitaker as empath and uh, like a nipple shooting acid or whatever that was at the end (laughs) that, that just like, it's like, why would you start with such an intellectual beginning and then just go off the rails as much as you did? I mean, I, I, I can't deny that it it was fun, but I just don't get the thinking behind it. Evan, what do you think? Did you think the, the concept was, was pretty sound from the start here? I think it was a good idea. I agree with you. Yeah. And I think it's strong, like you said, in the first maybe half hour or so. But I think it's kind of falls apart for a few different reasons. I think it's, it's the, the, the different characters and the way they relate to each other on like the team are very strange. Like, yes, mm-hmm. Ben Kingsley seems like he's in his own movie. Like none of the things he says seem to have any relation to what the other characters are talking about. He just seems like he's operating in his own world. And some of the characters, like there's a huge emphasis on Forrest Whitaker's character and his abilities as an empath, but they don't make any sense. He's often feeling things through video (laughs) or through secondhand (laughs) discussion. (laughs) There's a scene where they're in the nightclub and you would think, wouldn't he be overwhelmed by this? Wouldn't this right. just be too much emotion in one place for him to process? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good yeah. point. So that's that's weird. And I think the character 
of Syl has a very strange arc because she starts out, like you said, as Michelle Williams and she's a sympathetic character. She's a young girl. She's escaping captivity. We should be on her side. And then yeah. she turns into this really sexual being as an adult character. Yeah. And she's, you know, eroticized and, you know, we're supposed to find that titillating. And then we were supposed to want her dead. <laughs> it's this very strange kind of arc for a character. And I, I think, I think maybe when you guys said this, you know, when we were looking at your notes and stuff, it was like, who is supposed to be the protagonist of this movie? <laughs> Cause it doesn't seem like the <laughs> alien. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's but yeah. That- uh, go ahead, Chris. No, I was just gonna say, but I mean, I, uh, that that stood out to me too. That um, you had you would think that Ben Kingsley, being the one that like brings the team together, but uh, he his character is off on an island and go- basically goes nowhere, remains static. And then you've got Michael Madsen, uh, but he's also seen as like the tough guy. Like everybody's static here, except our potentially Forrest Whitaker who has like a realization in the caves underneath the LA hotel that like, mm-hmm. wait, I want to kill something. And it's, but that's not ever really explored either. Uh, so it's, it, it's, it, yeah, it's just a hodgepodge of just really weak characters and weak relationships. I don't, I didn't have any recollection of the, you know, sexual tension or romance None. that was supposed to be budding between Absolutely Michael not. Madsen and Mark Mark <laughs> Helgenberger. But it just comes across as just, uh, you know, nothing but plot contrivance here uh, and sticks out like a sore thumb. I mean, mm-hmm. Who do we think is the protagonist? I mean, there there's an early draft of the script where basically Syl calm, uh, kills the first cab driver, uh, dr- uh, driver. Right. She gets off the train, right? So they took that out to make her more empathetic. Why are they doing that? And then that's the big question. In the second half of the film, it's basically kind of like I think one of the reviewers said a slasher film. It turns mm-hmm. into a, a basically a slasher. And so then she's the antagonist. It's very, very unclear who we're supposed to be rooting for uh, and who we're supposed to empathize with. Um, and I think that that's you know, it's a pretty basic failure of script writing, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. Isn't that the thing they tell you in like script writing 101? Who's your protagonist? Propel them forward. Make them change. Uh, and none of that's really happening here. Do we think the casting had anything to do with this? <laughs> because Pierce Brosnan was supposed to play one of the main roles, I think, maybe the Ben Kingsley role, but he passed on it to do Golden Eye. If we mm-hmm. put different people in these roles, I'm thinking uh, Michael Madsen especially, does it work better? What if you put like Val Kilmer in the Michael Madsen role? <laughs> oh my God, Val Kilmer! <laughs> think about that. I mean, it's but I guess the the fundamental question here with the production and the casting part of this, like, I think Natasha really works, right? I think she's but mm-hmm. it's just kind of you know she has a very vibrant screen presence. It's not just her beauty; it's the way that she carries herself as well. She was a model before this, uh, so I think she really does play that paradigm quite well. Um, but the rest of the cast, do we feel like we could replace people and make this movie a lot better? I don't think so if you're not fixing the script, too. Yeah. Like you mentioned the the edit from the opening uh, collection of scenes with Young Sill. I mean, that's also like a basic screenwriting rule, right? That if you're, you can't just take things out to fix things, you also then have to, it's a domino effect, you have to fi- figure out what else you need to change down the line if you're taking things out that were essential to the to the start of the story. And I think that ultimately, uh, you know, I, I, I love Val Kilmer, but I also <laughs> love Michael Madsen, actually. I think that he, if anybody, uh, and Whitaker too, but like really did, you know, sink their teeth in, like to the point where there's a fun, you know, behind the scenes story of Michael Madsen fucking with Ben Kingsley on the set because Kingsley's taking himself so seriously. Uh, And, and I I actually kind of liked that dynamic in like a B movie kind of way. Uh, But it's just, it's just the writing, like even in on a, on a B movie, B movie level, like, uh, um, like April fool's day to go back to one of Mancuso's other uh, eight eighties, um, horror movies like that movie works largely because it really digs into a lot of those tropes and uh it, it, it all fits all the puzzle pieces fit together but this just feels like like you said eight drafts like they probably just ripped it apart so much and then they were relying so much on geiger and henstridge that to 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 come up with something and you know to their credit 
they I, they they gambled and they won. They did. It was a big hit at the box office, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely connect with with people um, back then, which is why we had Species Two and eventually Species Three and mm-hmm. Species Four. Although the last two were direct to TV, direct sci-fi. to sci fi, yeah. yeah, direct to sci fi, <laughs> and then DVD. So definitely to connect with people. Uh, what do you think did connect with people? Like I remember when this came out. Um, you know, I think I went to go see it because probably Natasha was a big sort of appeal there, but also the sci fi nature of it. What about that? the production design um, that seemed to copy alien in a lot of different ways. What do we think about that? And like, how does that hold up over time? Because that's one of the things where I think in the initial part of the film, again, seemed pretty decent. Um, But as you get further and further along in the film, it felt like that production design around the alien itself kind of fell off too. Like maybe they started to run out of Mm -hmm. money um especially like the 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 sewer finale like what's going on there like that just felt so rote uh, and boring uh, and i honestly on this rewatch i was checked out by that point uh you guys were like you guys said like you're very engaged i was done by the time it got to um uh her mating with one of the team members and, and killing him i was like okay cool and then it turns into a, a chase thing <laughs> And then I'm like, what? Yeah. Like, this doesn't, I don't know. This It didn't it's connect weird. with me at all. What do you guys, I mean, what was it about that production? Did you guys see that transition? Because in the first part, it almost seems like a mm-hmm. Michael Bay movie, like with the chase and the helicopters and like very action oriented. And then by the time you get to the end, it, I don't know. It just felt so underwhelming. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think the yeah. production time sort of waned a bit? Do you think it was good overall? I do. Yeah, I think yeah. it waned for sure. I think it was really strong in the beginning. And then, it, like you said, it felt rote, but also kind of boring. And just it didn't look very good either. Like yeah. when mm-hmm. the kid turned into the weird spider creature or whatever the hell it was <laughs> that oh, they yeah. set on fire, that just looked oh, yeah. terrible. It looked so bad. And just so bad. most of that sequence just looked just terrible. Um, but I think with sci-fi, good production design can definitely go a long way. I know that when I see sci-fi movies and they look interesting and there's interesting technology or creatures, I'm, I want to say more forgiving, but I'm more intrigued <laughs> as long as there's something there to keep, you know, keep me going visually. Yeah, I think yeah. What, what I noticed, too, is like in um, HR, I think his name is it's Geiger or Giger. I think he says Giger, Giger. in one video. Yeah, yeah y- you're right. <laughs> OK. And uh, I, it's funny that he sent this fax over to the producer, basically saying, you know, there's five similarities between what's going on in Alien and what's going on in Species. <laughs> and I thought that that was like it, that's one of the things without knowing that fact that he sent this over and was like upset about that. I think one of the things that stood out to me the most is that like every scene in that movie felt like I had seen it before somewhere else. And mm-hmm. it was, I felt extremely derivative in a lot of different ways, you know, throw out kind of this, uh, the spotty script. I think some of the casting was not great, but I think that's my opinion. Um, I, I think the derivative nature of a lot of the setup to me was just very, it just takes you out of it. It's not immersive at all because it's like, yeah, I've been there, done that. Uh, it reminded me a lot of that movie that came out. I can't remember. Is it called Life? Maybe that came out very recently. Right. Mm-hmm. Like yes. going space. Yeah. Right. Jake Gyllenhaal. Um, I watched Down to the-, the whole like putting the gloves in the, you know, uh, sterile uh, room outside yeah. with the control setting. Yeah. It's, and it's like ridiculous. even the the thing that really stood out to me was the with the um, Madsen's in there. uh uh, with the other, the lady from the team, I forget her name, and the cells are growing rapidly, and there's that quarantine moment that is yes. like note for note from Alien, and you're just yep. sort of like, what are yeah. you guys doing? Alien's not that old compared to this. It's like people know what you're doing. Why would you put that in there and not really add anything new? Uh, and of course, the one thing that I find really interesting about those scenes, the like something's on an outbreak, there's people in the room, it's you have to like burn the room or everyone's gonna get infected and there's like this disagreement to let people out, they always let them out, right? There's never a moment where they're just sort of like, yeah, we're gonna let them, we're gonna kill them with the disease in there. Right. I don't know, it's like, why are we doing this? Um, I don't know, did you guys get a sense of that derivative nature uh, that Giger saw with his own work being sort of copied? For sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that one of the biggest things that stood out to me, I mean, other than, 
like you said, Evan, the, the, the just the absolute horrible nature of the CGI felt like I was like at a land party in 97 or something. <laughs> and you and had lagging. this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you had this moment um, during that whole sequence, which, like I mentioned before, I'm, I guess I was kind of a sucker. I I, I fell into it as soon as uh, Forrest Whitaker started slamming back the Long Island iced teas. But Jesus. you had this really like just absurd sense of everything's going to be OK. Uh, and maybe that is, once again, something to do with the cast. Like Madsen is obsessed with always keeping his cool, no matter what character he's playing. Right. And that's probably why Tarantino likes him so much. But he him and uh, Mark Helgenberger, who's you know kind of wooden as an actor in general. But then even Forrest Whitaker, like once again, he himself is a really talented actor as he proved even more so after Species came out, but uh, was really just uh, acting based on how much he sweat uh, in the last (laughs) act of the movie. And so none of that helps it feel like there's any real stakes involved. And Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, for me, it also reminded me kind of like uh, we we had just rewatched this with our friends recently, Dan, uh, Anaconda, this whole just kind of like absurd, silly explosion of ensemble actors doing whatever the hell the director wants them to because it's funny or entertaining not because it's legitimately dramatic or thrilling like the last act of alien uh or any movie of that you know more elevated quality is but once again i think that comes back to conception were they trying to lean into that and i think that donaldson kind of thought he was i don't think kingsley <laughs> thought no, he was definitely not um he didn't get and that they, so it out. was just it was a complete mixed bag yeah a lack of communication between cast and crew um, your, your comment chris about the sweat reminded me of a weird thing in the movie where there's several close-ups in the beginning of ben kingsley's eyes and he seems to have yes. an inordinate amount of sweat around his eyes yes. yeah. <laughs> or how about the single tear the as single it tear <laughs> oh, i was like come on guys like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah that's why you that's why you hire sir ben um I, wait, I have a plot point here that I don't remember. Why did they have to kill her in the beginning? Do we know uh, why? Mm. They they re- they thought that it, they were realizing how dangerous she could be. Or she was I don't growing know, is, too fast. Also, another plot right. point that I think another reviewer from back in the '90s brought up was: okay, she's growing super rapidly. She goes from Michelle Williams to Nata- Natasha Henstridge in like a week or whatever. Um, why doesn't she keep growing? Like right. why does she, she should be an old stop? lady? Yeah, like why caverns. does she yeah. stop? I mean, I kind of get it from a reproductive cycle thing, but like it doesn't really add up. She should be like fifty by the end of the movie. Um, well, back then when it did come out, talking about the release of this thing and how it did um, with critics and all that, uh, Rotten Tomato score forty three percent, Top Critics forty one percent, so not very good. Metacritic forty nine. Uh, audience response, and this is over the years, of course, 31%. That seems really low to me. I thought audience people, audience members would like this a little mm-hmm. bit more. Um, Letterbox was 52, which is very bad. Um, I thought it would be <laughs> a little bit higher, too. Like, I, I guess the thing that's missing here, especially from um, the audience reception, is that campiness. I think mm-hmm. they just really, they miss that by a long shot. Um, because it's just not all the way there. Uh, the cinema score from back then, that would have been opening night Friday when it opened to B minus, which is not good. So the people who showed up opening day to see this didn't really enjoy it all that much. Um, and so, but it did well, right? $35 million production budget, which would be $60 million today. Um, it did, uh, $113 million worldwide, which is why we got the sequel in April of 1998, um, so it did okay. Critics kind of, you know, lashed out at it. Um, do we feel like this is one of those movies in the nineties? I mean, cause I remember going to the movie movies in the nineties and I would just go and see whatever, as long as oh, it yeah. was like sort of fascinating. And this is definitely one of those movies. Um, uh, I saw like everything like 5,000 miles to Graceland. I remember seeing like, why would I see that? <laughs> but I went to go see it because I was like a well, bored teenager and I just ha- hung out the cinemas. Um, that's why I went. I mean, do you feel like that? Do you feel uh, here's the question. Same similar movie comes out. OK, pre pandemic when there's actually movie theaters that exist. Does this movie succeed nowadays or are people too cynical and, and hate this sort of stuff too much or expect too much out of their movies now for this to be to do well? Do you think it would, would do well today? 
I, I, I don't know. What do you think, Evan? I feel like this is something that could uh, could easily go either way and not not moderate. I think it would either win, you know, be a, a home run or a complete failure. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you on that. I, it's not good enough <laughs> for it yeah, to be a not, major hit. <laughs> but audiences enough. surprise me sometimes. They they love movies. And I thought I or, you know, you you see a movie and you're hating it and the audience is cracking up and they're just eating it up. And you you, you walk out like, did we watch the same movie? I can easily <laughs> see that happening with this. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think so, too. I mean, you look at something like Life, though, and that was a pretty much a bomb. Right. So maybe, you know, mm-hmm. the sci-fi stuff, the soft sci-fi stuff, maybe Natasha would have got people to show up. I could see that. Um, but it was a different time back then. There wasn't like free porn everywhere. So I think that like that, <laughs> it just it's a different sort of ball game for that aspect. Yeah. Of it. Um, yeah. I do think I do think it's interesting uh, looking at uh, Gene Siskel's positive review of the movie. Yeah. From 95, because uh, I think that gives a little insight. He I mean, he calls it solid, surprisingly intelligent action picture. And he says, you know, firm pace right up until the end. He's just, uh, Donald Sid's in control of a most satisfying summer film. And it just like make, reminds me that, you know, other than who took his place, Richard Roper, I don't know who would be giving a movie like this a positive review in 2020. And so maybe without some of that more forgiving nature of the critics of the 90s that, uh, you know, there's obviously an argument to be had about how much if they if ever uh, critics have helped determine um, the performance of a movie at the box office, but I feel like there was definitely an overall, like, like you said, Dan, there was so much crap out there in the nineties yeah. that if it had some kind of entertaining kernel, uh, even something as basic as a topless, uh, main star, former model, that would be enough to, to get butts in the seats. But I, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm starting to think that more, Nowadays, it wouldn't. It, that would not be enough. It would have to also have, you know, some kind of connection to a, you know, a, a famous IP or something. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, the, the hook was definitely there. But the, I think this would, would be one of those movies that maybe the opening night does OK, but because of social media, it drops off immediately by Saturday. Right. And people right. are like, this is this thing is terrible. Uh, what else did critics think about this movie? I mean, there, it's mostly negative that I found. Um, yes. and like, you know, I think a good line here, there's like, there's a dividing line here where, um, and on the positive side, Jonathan, uh, Rosenbaum from Chicago reader, uh, he says, in spite of all its unexplained and semi-ridiculous plot premises, it works surprisingly well as a genre exercise. So I think that's your sort of foot in the door to a positive viewpoint. This is a genre film. It's not meant to be taken seriously. Yeah, there's a lot of campiness and it's all over the place, but that's kind of it's kind of fun. And I talked to a friend about this. She's like, oh, I love this movie. It's such a campy sort of romp. I was like, "Okay, like I can see from that perspective where you could see it in a positive sort of viewpoint. But I also like Mick LaSalle, who's like my favorite reviewer from San Francisco Chronicle. He says, if only species were a little bit worse, it would have a shot at becoming a camp classic. So it's (laughs) kind of like that that weird middle ground. I think the 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 thing that I keep coming back to was their intention here to make this a very campy, um, very loose, uh, fun sci-fi kind of exo- uh, erotic thriller. Was their intention here? Because I don't really see it at all. I see a lot of serious attempts to make a a, a thriller, like a, mm-hmm. a dramatic thriller with you know some high stakes oh you know if we don't stop her it's the end of the human race right but you don't do you feel any of that no it kind of like hits a brick wall but i think one of the reasons why i don't think the movie's very successful at all when it sets out to do is because it tries to hit a home run in a game of basketball if that makes sense it's trying to do something (laughs) different than it's supposed to that's supposed to be doing i think if it was super campy like mick is saying it could have been I think the movie would be way better, right? Like a, not like mm-hmm. a scary movie parody type situation or Spaceballs, which we just watched with our group of friends. Oh, nice. Classic. <laughs> uh, not like a Spaceballs, but more of like a, I don't even know. Is there something out there, an example of a film that you can think of uh, maybe in the sci-fi space or that's like almost like a soft parody, like a little bit of camp. Um, like, uh, I don't know. The first thing that comes to my mind is, 
I mean, I feel like if there was somebody like Sam Raimi behind the camera, like I was mm-hmm. thinking yep. Army of Darkness, right? Yes, yeah. If there, if there was that just kind of zaniness, just this no holds barred, it could have been really fun. It could have been something like Anaconda. But uh, yeah, I think there was, there were too many, too many, uh, yeah, misfires in terms of both casting and uh, crew members that just there was no, no strong vision to bring it that direction. Yeah. And what do you think? Uh, Can you think of anything that kind of would, would go along this route of a parody that would work? You know, to be honest, I'm drawing a blank in terms of uh, campy sci-fi, of course. But you know what, (laughs) you know what comes to mind? Lost in space. The Lost yeah. in Space adaptation. Oh, sure. In totally, terms of yeah. camp. Yeah. If it was something along those lines that didn't take itself so seriously, I agree with you, Dan. I think this would be a much better movie. I agree with that quote, too. I think the problem is that this movie is taking itself seriously and is playing it straight. And <laughs> therein lies the problem because it's not, <laughs> it's just not well written enough to be serious. So if it had been a little more ridiculous, uh, the dialogue a little goofier, then it, yeah, it would have. I think worked better. What's a Absolutely. much better sci-fi movie from this era? I was trying to think off the top of my head, but I saw all the <sighs> I saw the trash ones. I saw like Arrival, which came out what a year after this the, or something like that. I mean the the Charlie Sheen Charlie Arrival. Sheen movie. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I remember that one. Terrible. I mean, just unwatchable. Or like the the Fifth Element, I think is a a great Good, example yeah. of a movie. Yes, that's super campy, but also it's has perfect. like this. Yeah sincerity to it that also kind of makes it work i don't know it's a be- it's... that's a beautiful film i feel like mm-hmm. um yeah. i don't know i can't think of anything else out of that that time period of like that there was just so much schlock uh, maybe because sci-fi channel was like big or something or there's just like or maybe sci-fi and like horror always has this sort of gutter part of the industry where they're just like making <laughs> yeah. whatever, put out that swill on DVD or yeah. uh, now it's straight to VOD and people will consume it like I do sometimes. Uh, and like there's just a set audience for this stuff. And that's one of the reasons why I think it went that route eventually. Species 2 did get mm-hmm. a main release, right? And it made not a lot of money, but it was MGM again. It was a real movie. Um, but then t- obviously three and four were sci-fi technically like sci-fi originals almost. And then to DVD right afterwards, they kind of went that genre, uh, niche route. Um, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was the intention from the start and basically saying, Hey, here's a sci-fi movie. We're always going to have an audience. We're going to, do you think they thought they were going to do a franchise out of this when they started it? <laughs> <laughs> it's really uh, tough to say i, I have proof yeah. that they did i have proof that they yes, did because really? they signed right. really? natasha on for three films from the start from the start and so that's wow. why she was in two and then in three she's in the first scene because she was contractually obligated to be in the third one <laughs> <laughs> so that's they really had high awesome. hopes for this this was this is a big deal to them um do we feel like i don't know to kind of close it out here uh, I think that one of the things, you know, why we do this podcast is to sort of, uh, especially with the older movies, to kind of go back and reevaluate them, especially someone if we saw them when we were younger, and to kind of pull out things that are interesting about film hi- history and film production um, that, you know, are sort of highlights of even a bad film could have something you can take away that that's fascinating. Um, and I think one of the things that I find interesting about this film and how it was produced um, is that I, I felt like all of the pieces were there to make something really interesting and fascinating. And you even think about the the struggle they got to make this, the eight drafts of the script and all the pieces that had to come together. Casting Natasha was a huge deal. Um, a really compl- uh, convoluted process to get to production and releasing this thing. And then you get this final product that is not very good. Um, it just sort of reminds me of all these sort of pieces that have to come together to create a movie. It's not an easy task to do, right? And so even if you have all this stuff come together and you're lucky enough to get there, it doesn't mean you're going to end up with something even remotely good, despite all the hard work uh, and pressure you went through to get there. Um, and I don't know. I think that that's kind of one of my takeaways from Species. Do you guys have any takeaways? <sighs> I mean, it's it, the the central takeaway that I keep coming back to is that, yeah, they could have been a few ticks worse at their jobs to to make the movie more enjoyable, ironically. But ultimately, 
it's a curio from the 90s that I think merits like you could have a whole other discussion about misogyny in oh, absolutely. Uh, the horror genre and this could take a, a starring role in that especially yeah. with like the strange double talk about you know uh you 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 chose to make her female because you thought she'd be more submissive that kind of thing where like it it sounds like there's there's someone in here a subconscious voice or a conscious voice that thinks that they're doing something subversive and maybe even in like a sick and twisted way they think they're feminist but there's so there's enough to wrangle with in here that i think it really sticks out as a a a valid curio of the 90s even if it doesn't hit all the marks we would want it a movie either that's bad or good and for that alone i i i i'm glad that i picked the movie this week and that yeah. we did revisit it because i think it merits that kind of discussion if for no other reason as just this uh this snapshot of uh awfulness that was the 90s that i think often gets glossed over as oh the halcyon days of cinema <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I could see this uh, uh, a paper of misogyny in this film and like a film studies class in a graduate level. Easy. I mean, easily. Um, Evan, what do you think? Uh, any sort of takeaways here from from Species and maybe your first watch? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of the things you guys were saying. I think it is a weird curiosity of a movie in terms of sci-fi not being good or great being kind of mediocre but still having something here that is interesting some interesting ideas even if they're kind of you know ripoffs <laughs> of alien <Yeah. laughs> or um, the, the death sequence i think was definitely reminiscent of terminator 2 oh, uh, sure. much another much better yeah, movie point, of man. the sci-fi movie of the era yeah, it's just, I agree. I think there there could be something really interesting here in the idea that they decided to make the alien a woman, you know, for control. And I, that is a really interesting idea. <laughs> it's probably worth discussing. But I don't I don't know that that was the intention. Right. <laughs> like, it feels kind of like possibly a throwaway line of dialogue that we're <laughs> trying to make meaning out of years later. And I think, I don't know, for me, there's always something to be said about just you know, either campy or just goofy movies that are fun to watch, even if they're not substantive. <laughs> and I think yeah. this movie definitely falls under it. Although it, it's like I said, it feels weird. The you know, um, the arc of the alien that feels a little uncomfortable to think about. Like she's yeah. a child, mm-hmm. she's sexual. Now she's supposed to be dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reduce think, the movie to that one sentence. I like that. Yeah. And I think, <laughs> I think now maybe they would, put a little more thought or nuance into a movie of this size. Cause I think there's always going to be, you know, direct to sci-fi or direct yeah. to video or whatever you want to call it films. Like you were saying before, Dan, I think there's always going to be kind of like schlocky low tier movies that require even less thought than this one. But I, I enjoyed watching this, um, especially because like I said, I wasn't even sure that I had seen it if I was mixing up species two and that was what I had seen. <laughs> Yeah. I was a little younger than you guys, so I didn't I didn't see this in the theater. Um, but I growing up, my grandpa and I used to watch a lot of movies and he had a very large VHS collection, which often included, you know, a, a varying degree of sci fi and action yeah. movies. I'm going to admit there's a lot of Steven Seagal that was mixed in there. But <laughs> oh, um, yeah, <laughs> Under Siege 2 Dark Territory. Classic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the Steven Seagal. And yeah, it's just I don't know. I enjoy fun, you know, just goofy sci fi and, and action movies. And we were talking before about camp and one that I did think of is the faculty. And I think that is a great yes. mix of you know, horror, sci-fi, camp, if it was more in that direction, I think it would have worked. That's a perfect yeah. example. That's a film we just watched with our friends as well. And like, it's one of my, that's one of my favorite films from the era. Cause it's part of that sort of dimension slasher kind of horror uh, movement mm-hmm. that happened around scream. And it mm-hmm. does. It's Kevin like that Williamson perfect, hitting his stride. Yeah, yeah. It's like that perfect mixture, right. Of, of the, the campiness and kind of a little bit of seriousness, but it just, that's a really hard alchemy, isn't it? Like if you're mm-hmm. mixing and mishmashing all that stuff and if you don't do it right, I think you get something like species, which is kind of fun to watch. Maybe <laughs> guilty pleasure is what you'd call it, but it's uh, I don't think it's hitting any home runs. Um, Evan, no, but... I really appreciate you, appreciate you uh, joining us for this episode. Tell us a little bit about yes. your podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Um, so I'm co-host for a show called Spoiler Peace Theater. We're a weekly film podcast. We review new movies and 
we don't let spoilers get in the way of our discussion. So we don't do spoiler warnings. We just talk whatever we talk about, whatever we want to talk about. And nice. uh, we've always just felt really strongly that if a movie is good, it, it, it really doesn't matter whether it's spoiled for you or not, because you can hear what's going to happen and have a deeper appreciation. We actually sit down and watch it kind of knowing what's going to happen. And I find that to be true. Like I would say maybe 99% of the time, I think there's occasionally there's a 1% time where I've been on the show and maybe I didn't see a movie and I went and saw it and was like, yeah, yeah, maybe it wasn't quite as effective. I think parasite is an example of that where I think it's a tremendous film, but I think yeah. knowing what happened kind of made, put me on my, right. you know, totally. you know, it created a sense of anxiety where I was just trying to anticipate everything before it actually got there. That's great. Awesome. Well, well yeah, yeah, definitely check it out. The, the dynamic between you and the co host is, so uh, yeah. is really fun. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, next week, Dan, you're picking the new movie that we are going what are we, to what is it called? Uh, trial trace. Of, trial of Chicago seven. Is that what it's called? That's, that's the one you're, <laughs> I don't know why I picked uh, this Aaron Sorkin Netflix movie. I've already seen it. Um, it's going to be a fun ride. That's going to be an okay. interesting episode. We're going to have uh, yeah. our friend Molly join us from Chicago. Uh, she knows a lot about Chicago activism, so she's going to join us for that episode. Uh, appreciate y'all listening. Uh, thanks again. This has been Film Trace. Mm-hmm.